anyways. So he's already done. We got and we got to edit that out. Good evening, guys. Nice crowd. Really nice. Um, it's with great pleasure that we welcome you to the second of a five-part guest speaker series at Shari Shalom. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for the series, Elliot and Jennifer Dweck, with the Dweck Family Foundation, for sponsoring the series. Tonight's class is in memory of my father, Shemuel Ben Malkun Amai. For those of you who are new to the series, which is most of you, uh, Shari Shalom wants to create a forum in our synagogue under which knowledgeable individuals in our community could give a class or a lecture on a Torah-related topic of his or her choice. Uh, we plan to select, select the diverse speakers that have a commitment to Torah study and community hesed and other unique qualities, the ultimate goal being that this will help motivate others to do the same. Our guest speaker tonight, David Cohen, grew up in the Syrian community, attending Mag and David Elementary and High School. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 2002 and has been a financial analyst for various investment management firms since then. When he has the opportunity, he gives shurim on a variety of Torah topics, generally focusing on Torah and Halakha. Please welcome David Kahn. Welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, so the, the question that, uh, that we're addressing here tonight is the question that uh, we were a little bit inflammatory in putting out the... Uh, putting out the email, the question was, what was it exactly? Can we go back to one day of Yom Tov? Um, I guess you could also phrase the question as, why don't we go back to one day of Yom Tov? Um, and what we'll find in the Shirut is that, is that this question has actually been asked uh, multiple times before in history and has been answered dozens of times in many, many different She'elot Tuchuvot. The answer, by the way, has always been the same answer, okay? which makes it a little bit hard for me to get to yes. Um, so the, the, the inspiration for this class is that every time I sit down in my parents' house on, uh, on Yom Tov, is my, my brother, as, as my wife will tell you, says, why can't we just do one day of Yom Tov? The whole reason for doing two days of Yom Tov is because of the Safek. We don't have the Safek anymore. Right? So why don't we just move back to one day? Everybody knows what the calendar is. This is the day, and that's it. Which, the logic, at least on its face, seems like it makes some sense. Okay? Um, and we're going to talk about that logic. We're going to talk about the first place that the question comes up. We're going to talk about the, the, the time in history that the question came up. And we're going to address one teshuvah in particular detail. And then we're going to wrap it up with trying to understand why the logic and the, uh, the, uh, the reality don't necessarily uh, work together in this particular case. And they don't work together in general when it comes to law, but in this particular case, we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll take a stab at why, that's, why they don't work out. Okay, so the, if, you guys, if you guys don't have a source sheet, you can pick up the source sheet over there. Uh, Barry has them over here. We'll see how much we get to I'd like to get to as much of the source sheet as possible. It's all uh, very good stuff. And we'll start with the Gemara. I started up here. I bracketed off the Gemara as we're going to do it. I'll try to go through the Gemara very quickly. The Gemara says as follows. Itmar. We have an, an, an Amoraic dispute. Shenei amim tovim shel galuyot. The two, day, the two days that we celebrate of Yom Tov in the Galut. Rav Amar no da bazeh muteret bazeh. If you have an egg that's born on the first day of Yom Tov, you're allowed to eat the egg or make use of the egg on the second day of Yom Tov. The says, no, if the egg was uh, hatched or, or was, uh, was sorry, the, the chicken laid the egg on the first day of Yom Tov, you cannot eat or use the egg on the second day of Yom Tov. So it seems like Rav Asse holds that the two days of Yom Tov are one gigantic day. They're not two separate units. They're one unit of Yom Tov. Because he's telling you if the Betsa was born on the first day, you can't use it on the second day, meaning it's one unit. right? Otherwise, meaning it, if, if it were two separate units, you'd be able to use it on the second day because you don't have an issue of Muktzeh. Because the first day is one unit on its own. The second day is, is a second unit, all on its own. So if it's Muktzeh on the first day, 
not necessarily Muktze on the second day. But he holds that it is Muktze on the second day. So it must be one Kedusha, one unit of Kedusha. So the Gemara asks, But we also know we have this, this Ma'ase Rav, this story of Rav Ase, that he used to make Havdalah on the first day of Yom Tov. Right? After the first day of Yom Tov, Motza'e Yom Tov Rishon, you're about to start your, uh, your Seder, the, the second night of Pesach, he makes Havdalah first, like a full Havdalah, not like a Yaknehaz thing, a real Havdalah. So how is it that he said that you're not allowed to use the egg on the second day? So the Gemara answers, no, he's, he's not really sure whether it's one unit or two units. He does a humrah both ways. He's mahmir to do the abdallah, and he's also mahmir to, uh, uh, to not use the betzah and hold of muktzeh on the second day. Amr <coughs> Bizerah, the Bizerah says he is a later emora. He says as follows, I have some proof that the halakha is like Rabbi Why? Because today, we all know which day is which. We know what, what, de, what, what day is, the, is Rosh Chodesh, and subsequently we know which day is Pesach, which day is Sukkot. And yet, even though we, we know what day is which, we still do two days of Yom Tov. So it must be that we hold that it's one unit, because... There's no safek. It's not like the first day was Yom Tov and the second day isn't, or the, sec- or the first day you did Bishum Safek and the second day is the real one. They're both real ones because we know which day is which and we still do them both. So if they're both real ones, it must be one unit and therefore the Bitzah is Mukti. Okay? Abaya says, no, I, I disagree with you, Rabbi Zerah, Kivate Derav Mistabera. And this is where. The, uh, the, the meat of the sugya comes from, and we, we end up being posek like Abaye. No, it's really two kedushot. It's really two separate units. Ditnan, and I'll tell you the story of how we get there. We have Mishnah. The Mishnah says as follows. Barishona, at the beginning, hayu masi'in masu'ot. So what happened all the way at the beginning? The bed din decides which day is Rosh Chodesh. The witnesses come, they say, we saw the moon this way and that, and the Beit Din says, fine, this day is Rosh Chodesh. What did they use to do? How did they use to get that message across to everywhere else in the Jewish world? If you had Jews living in Iraq and Iran, how did they get the message? So they used to have these, this system, right, where they used to go up on tall mountains and have these large bonfires, and they used to send, I guess, some sort of smoke signal or fire signal or whatever it is, and they got these out really quickly, and this is, this is obviously a much faster system than sending a human being all the way to Iran, or sending multiple human beings who are relaying to Iran, right? And so everybody knows through this, uh, this uh, smoke signal system what day is Yom Tov. But, Mishikil Kielu HaKutim, the Samaritans who lived in, uh, in the, uh, uh, I guess, in, in the Shomron, in what, we, what is the West Bank today, they messed things up for us. They started putting up these bonfires at the wrong times to confuse everybody as to what's the right day of Rosh Chodesh. And you had the Jews in the, in the Galut doing the wrong days because the Samaritans messed up the system on purpose and they, they built these bonfires on the wrong days on purpose to confuse everybody. So they changed the system. Itkinu they sent out messengers. And if the Samaritans stopped or they, they disappeared from the face of the earth, and uh, we can go back to the old system, we would go back and do one day. This is at the time of the Galut, by the way, the time of the Second Temple. And whether it happened before, before the Second Temple period in, in the time of the first exile, we'll get to in, uh, in the Teshuvah in a second, but it definitely is what happened during the Second Temple period. Okay, this is how they got the message across. They started with the bonfires, they stopped the bonfires, they ended up sending messengers. Now, messengers aren't getting to Iran in two weeks, right? So, uh, the people, what did the people in Iran have to do? The people where the messengers didn't get to, I'm just using Iran as the example here of the, of the, place, of the place where messengers could not get to in time. What did they do? They had to do two days of Yom Tov. But they, they did two days of Yom Tov. It was a legitimate safek. They didn't know which day was which. 
Okay? So the Gemara is telling you, were it not for these Samaritans, we would go back to doing one day during the Second Temple period. Vehecha and where the messengers did reach. Avdin and Hadyoma, they do one day. Right? Vehashta, but now. We know the schedule. We know which day is Rosh Chodesh. Why do we do two days? And here's the punchline answer that we're going to be discussing for the rest of the Shirur. The reason is because they sent from there. The Gemara mitam usually means Eret Israel. So they must have sent a She'ela to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael, and the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael sent them back the following answer. Be careful, guard the minhag of your forefathers. There are times where they, you may end up in a situation where the empire under whose rule you currently are will uh, have some sort of anti-Torah, anti-Jewish uh, decrees. Something is going to go wrong. Look at Ashi. I put the Ashi over here. The Gazera Machut Gezera. Shelo Yitzchakub Torah. You're not going to be able to learn or to remember the uh, details of the laws. Ve'ishtakach Sod Haribur. And you're not going to remember the exact calculation of which days are Rosh Chodesh and which are not. You're going to end up doing one day, just like you've been used to. And you're going to end up not knowing which is the right day, because you're going to forget the Sodari Buddha, you're going to forget the calculations. You're going to make a 29-day month into a 30-day month. You're going to take a 30-day month and turn it into a 29-day month, all unwittingly, by accident, because you forgot the calculation. And what's the, the really terrible thing with the Chuluk Hametz Pesach? You're going to end up violating a karet. You're going to eat Hametz on Pesach. Now, this statement in the Gemara, Hizaru bin Hagabot Echem Echem, Zimnin de Gazrua Machut Gezerah, if you look at Ashi, he very clearly reads that entire statement as one statement. Why should you be careful and watch the Minhag of your forefathers? Because Zimnin de Gazrua Machut Gezerah. It's possible. Because it's possible for the empire to decree certain decrees, that's why you should keep the minhag. What was the halakha did in Eretz Israel when it wasn't when it wasn't Jewish government? Mm -hmm. Did they still keep only one day? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. We're going to get to that question in the Teshuvah over here. The question is: This logic applies to Eretz Israel also, right? Right? I mean, is that, that, that's the question, right? Yeah, the logic the is, the empire is going to decree decrees, and you're going to forget the system, mm -hmm. and you're going to do one day in the Iyah Hametz on Pesach, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, the same, question, the same logic applies to Eretz Yisrael. Fine. I, I, I'm going to put that on hold because we're going to answer it. Okay? Twice in history, this question of why are we doing two days of Yom Tov comes up. Okay, the first time is in the 9th, the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries with the Karaites. The Karaites make fun of the traditional Jews. What are you guys doing? Two days of Yom Tov. Not only, first of all, are two days of Yom Tov nowhere in the Torah, but you guys are violating a love of Baal Tosif. That's, that's the Karaite Ta'ana. Okay? The two answers that we have from the Geonim to the Karaite Ta'ana are the first one is Dab Sa'adiyah's answer. And I didn't even put it on here. So Adya answers, Moshe Rabbeinu told us that in the Galut we do two days. That's what Afsa Adya answers. Rav Haigaon has four Teshuvot on the matter. In one of the Teshuvot, he calls what Rav Adya says as a kane lidhot bo apikoros. It's a stick with which to beat back the, uh, uh, the heretics. Okay, so Rav Haigaon does not... Have all take Rav Saadiyah's answer seriously. He says that it's just the, it's just the polemics, as we, we, would, we would say today. He's not serious. Moshe Rabbeinu never commanded to do two days of Yom Tov. And that's clear from the Gemara also. Because the Gemara says, if it weren't for the Samaritans, we'd go back to one day. 
So let's go through Rav Hai's Teshuvah. Rav Hai uh, uh, is a ladder gaon, okay? And this is, I, I think, his clearest Teshuvah of the matter. He has another Teshuvah that's eight pages long um, that I didn't think was clear at all, and which parts of it, I think, contradict this. But this is his very, very clear Teshuvah, where in the underlying section here, um, he lays out his logic. Okay. First of all, if I just to ask you guys, if I had to uh, label the nature of the practice of doing two days of Yom Tov based on the Gemara's words over here, what word might you come up with? Okay. One of the okay. So I heard two things. I heard Minhag and I heard Gizera. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Because uh, we'll see. We'll see in a second. I don't have it on the sheet, but we'll see in a second. The concept of Minhag gets brought up much, much later, and that's the question that everybody, all the rabbis will be dealing with when we get to the question of the 19th century. Is it possible you could create a sheet or no white? Um, why would you say that? Meaning it's not in the text. I, is it possible to say the shoot? Is the question? I, I don't like. I mean, I don't know why I would say that it's a shoot. I mean, it's either custom because we use the word hizaruga bin hagavotechem, so that, you know you have that, and then there's gezera. Um, although the, the word Gezera here is used as the decree of the empire, it's not used as the decree of the, the Hachami. Okay? Um, but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what Abhai says over here. I'm going to start from the beginning. The question is, he, re, he paraphrases the question of, that, is, that is sent to him. The Abba, the Gemara, what is it? Who sent him the question? One of the communities in the, in the Gola. He gets asked this question. Yeah, 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 not the Karai. I mean, they're not going to have, they don't care what he has to say. I mean, they don't care what the rabbinic, uh, uh, right, they don't, I mean, at all. Ushashal Tem, the Abba, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, Abba Ragir de Yativ Tren Yoman Ta'anita, I used to do two days of Yom Kippur, and my Sfekah Vale. What's the fact that he has? De Yativ Ta'anita Tren Yomeh, that he sat in a Ta'anit for two days. Im Haya Noheg, if he was using the calculations that we're using, then there's no safik. And if he was not using these calculations, what was he using? What was he calculating? How did he come up with the days? Zota Teshuva, Rabbi says. Bli safik, without a doubt, ki hashbon ze shebeyadenu hayu hoshvin. The calculation that we're making right now is the same calculation that they were making back then. What we do, two days of Yom Tov, they used to do back then. Look where he dates this to. From the beginning of the exile, he's not talking about the second exile, he's talking about the first exile. From the days of the prophets. We knew this calculation the whole time. And he says this in his other Teshuvah also. We knew this calculation. In his other Teshuvah, he goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says, we knew this calculation from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. He says this is not... And he, he implies this is not rocket science. It's 29 and a half days, you know the calculation. It's not a big deal. You could do it if, yourself. If anything, if it doesn't make sense to me, is he can't from Rosh Chodesh. The holidays are all given in terms of day count from Rosh Chodesh. It's right. on the tenth of the month. It's on the fourteenth mm -hmm. of the month. The, you, you just have to know when Rosh Chodesh so, is. So Anybody the, can count day night. So right? here's the problem with so Rosh Chodesh: is that a lunar cycle is twenty nine and a half days approximately, and so you could make the Rosh Chodesh on the on the thirtieth day or the or or the thirty first day. You have all the holidays. What the, the earliest holiday is Kippur is on the tenth. After the, that, yeah. Rosh Hashanah, you don't celebrate the next day. You celebrate two days, so don't, they can't even use I'm that. Not, I don't want to get into Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a total that's, that's complex my point. topic. So, 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 so don't even go there. Just go straight straight to the Shlosh Ragalim. They all fall out pretty much the in the 15. middle of the month, right? They all fall One out is Shavuot. Shavuot is, 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 Shavuot is ir irrespective. Of, remember, the Shavuot has right. nothing to do with the day of the month. That's 50 that, days from the second day of the month. That's my point exactly. So you have plenty of time to get the message out as to when Rosh Hashanah is. And everybody can so, count the so days. So here you have a, the fact is they couldn't get the, they, they could not get the message out to the farthest communities for from Pesach and Sukkot. I'm struggling with it. <laughs> remember, they're, they're, they're going on foot. They get to, you have Jews in Iran and, in, and even in some parts of Europe at this time. Okay. 
They just they didn't they couldn't get there. I mean th these those are facts that they couldn't get there. Um, I, I mean I wonder I didn't do it I guess you can you can Google how long it would take you to, to walk <laughs> from uh, from Jerusalem to uh, an extra day is not going to help what an extra day is not going to help no an extra day is going to help because because you know it can only be one of two days the extra day is not going to help I agree it's got nothing to do with the extra day you know that it can only be one of two days. Because it's 29 and a half days, so it's one of the two. Well, Rabbi is going to talk about that in a second. It can only be one of two days. It's not about the extra day. It's about bracketing help. it, basically. It's about bracketing it. That's exactly, mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is. Anyway, so when he did, does it finally reset to when they know what the actual day was? When do they finally get you reset? Because, like you said, Shavuot's 50 days later. Right. So, when. Because if it's one of two oh, days. Oh, so Shavuot. The calendar is going to be completely off by. Everybody agrees, by the way, that Shavuot everybody knew about. And the reason you do Shavuot two days is a Gezera, Atu, Pesach, and, and uh, Rosh Hashanah, and uh, Sukkot. That's a Gezera. So that, everybody agrees that you're going to get everywhere by Shavuot. Okay? Everybody's going to know that. But that's, a, that's a Gezera in the Gemara that's brought down the Sechet Rosh Hashanah. Okay? It was like super cloudy for three days. And then they, they, would, they would just make it a 30 day. It would just be a 30 day month. Yeah. Whenever the Bethany and Yerushalayim declare. So, this is like, this is one of the things I found out. If you guys go through Rosh Hashanah and you go through Masechet um, uh, this is a, I, found, I found this out. I guess I must have known this because I've been through Rosh Hashanah before. But the thing we're taught when we're kids that like everything went by the witnesses and the moon exactly. It's, it's very it's very neat and nice, but that's not how they actually did it. There would be times where the Betin very much knew the calculation, and they saw that this guy was coming, and he knew how to declare the moon, and they would intimidate him and make sure that he didn't uh, witness. And sometimes that they knew it should be early, and nobody came, and they decided to declare it themselves. Okay? So there are mahlukot about this stuff. There's tons of suyot about them. It's, it's not as clear-cut or mm -hmm. as clean as, as, as we learned early on, that the witness is common, it's not, it doesn't work exactly like that. But in theory, it does, in practice, it did. Because the Bedin had the calculation. At some point, they had it, right? I don't know if it went back this early, but at some point, they had it. Anyway, he dates... Kippur, I'm sorry, Kippur is, is uh, one, one day, not two. Right. Why yeah, do we do? Question, why don't we do? Why do we do? Why don't we do? Why don't we do? Why don't we do? You're gonna be consistent. So, so in that case, part of the gezera, the reason we do this is because of the of the original gezera that you should do the safek. Part of the gezera is that you shouldn't fast two days. Okay. Even if you even if you screwed even if you screwed up and it's the wrong day. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So, I want you to know that that's like kind of like a trick. A lot of times you can get further into that because when you're asking the, on the gezera, it's like, oh, it was included in the original gezera. Right. You're worried about Hamas on Pesach. So, 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 they so, about eating on so, so in this case, Achavim took it upon themselves that they, they said you can't do it. It's just impossible. So they carved out the gezera. So they carved they carved it out. You can also, I mean, I guess they also figure people will die if they do two days of uh, of Yom Kippur. So um, I could just dance for silly for myself. What? Just kidding. Use the extra city. <laughs> I'm sure that there, I, almost everybody here disagrees. Um, so he dates back this. Uh, an extra day, maybe. <laughs> he dates back the custom to Mima Nevi'im. They used to know this calculation from the days of the Nevi'im. So if they knew the calculation, by the way, he's asking your question, Mars, and he's answering your question at the same time. He's saying, we all knew the calculation. Okay? The, the only times that we were off from the calculation was in emergency circumstances we're going to talk about in a second. The bet din, the central bet din, the shano fifnei We all know what the calculation is. We all knew what the calculation was. Everybody knew what the calculation was. Going back hundreds, thousands of years, everybody knew what the calculation was. Okay? And they would celebrate Yom Kippur Mars, to your point, on the calculated day, where they had the calculation. Okay? But, when there would be a decree, or there would be some sort of other need that Bedin decided, they needed to change the day of when Rosh Chodesh would be. They used to change the day. They used to say, Really, this month is supposed to be a 30-day month, but it's going to be 29 days for whatever reason they need it. 
Maybe they had X number of days to give so in something to whoever the king was. What? So they couldn't go by the calculation. So they couldn't go by the calculation that month, so they changed it that month. But generally, they would just declare it on time. The kotvin alehen, and they used this betin, would then send out kemashe perashnu lemana, like we, we said in the previous teshuvah. By the way, we don't have the previous teshuvah. These teshuvah this teshuvah of Rav Hai was found in the Cairo Geniza in two separate documents. Okay, so and, and you'll see that in a second. So he says they used to send it out. Ufichach nimnu neviim. The prophets got together in their betin. Meinhigu et Yisrael asot shnei amim tovim shagaluyot. You guys got to do two days because we might, as a betin, end up doing an extra day here, a missing day there. And this would be the way things work: the entire days of the Talmud, the, the entire. Uh, uh, second temple period through the time where Hillel II puts together the calendar. She'im havasham shmad, if there was a decree from the government, they would have to add a day to the month, they would add a day. This is the second fragment, next, next column. If they would add a day this month, they would take away the, a day, a day the, second, the next month. Like you said before, it's, it's one of the two days. They weren't sure, sure which day. The, 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 the Jews who are here, where Rabhai is meaning in, in Babylonia, okay, in Iraq, they don't care what the Bedin would have done. Add a day, take away a day. It would be one of the two days. They would do two days, and they were certain that it would end up being one of the two days. Okay? Here's the punchline of Rav Haai. We don't have any more. What's be'emet? We don't have any more be'din that'll add a day or take away a day. We know the calculation. There's no possibility that the be'din is going to change it up. Yesh alenu shnei amim, we still have two days, kemin hag ha'avot. Just like the custom of our forefathers. He's using the language of the Gemara. Ki ha'nevi'im, why? Ki ha'nevi'im in higu shnei yovim tovim shel galuyot. The nevi'im, at the beginning of the first exile, directed all the Jews in the Gola to do two days because of this afik. Ve'af ilu anu amrim. Even if we understand that the reason they told us to do two days is because of, we might change around the month this month, and you got to do two days because of the Safek, and now we don't have this changing up. You need another Bet Din to come and change the original Gezerah. Okay? Don't um, they say that then there's even when. Mashiach comes, they're not going to change uh, that part. They're still going to have two I, days of Yom Tov. I, I, I'll tell you what, based on the Teshuvot that, uh, that, we're, we write, that I'm, we're reading that's here, not it that's like. not, uh, I mean, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. I don't know what's going to happen, Mashiach. Okay, that's it. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, but the, the point he's making is like this. He's, he's putting this under a rubric of a Gezerah Bedin. We have a, a, we have a well-known... Uh, a well-known uh, rule when it comes to Gezerot of Bedin, minyan, any Gezerah that Bedin made, Tzarich Vigana Hilatiro, requires another Bedin to change the original Gezerah. Of course, by the way, this makes perfect sense. If you have any, in any legal system, if a court or a legislature decides something, we don't just abrogate the law without another court or legislature changing it later on, right? Look at our justice system. Like, we, we don't just abrogate laws, you know, uh, uh, by fiat. It, the legislature has to change the laws. Okay, so, so the, the concept makes perfect sense. So it needs another betin. He's now placing the nevi'im of the first exile on this theoretical betin that, uh, that made the original gezerah. He's like, who's going who's gonna to beat those guys in rank? Right, it's like, uh, you know... Le'avdil, it's like uh, overruling, you know, uh, 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 the John Marshall Court. Like, you don't have to overrule them. What? I mean, you don't have to overrule. It's not a question of overruling them. Of course, you have, you have to change the Gezerah. The Gezerah was due two days. But the reason was because of the Safik. The reason doesn't apply anymore. The Gezerah still does. Is it the only reason? If you present what? new facts... From what we know here, it's the only reason. Let me get rid of that one yet. What? Let me get me out. We're going to get, we're gonna get at the end, we're going to get to... 
uh, a teshuva that asks, what do you mean? I have like five other examples where we, where we did abrogate it. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. But in general, the rule is, if you have a betin and it makes a law, even if you know the reason for the law, even if the reason doesn't apply anymore, the, the law still stands. Okay? That, again, that deal applies today too. Okay? Uh, I, I, this is an example. I mean, forgive me for bringing up this example, but sodomy laws still apply in certain, in certain states in the United States. Right? The law is still on the books. It, theoretically, and I, I mean, I remember reading something that's happened in the last decade. Like, you can still prosecute someone for this. The, the law clear, I mean, it, it doesn't apply to our time. I, okay. I, I, the, the point my, is my my point is they the Bedin at the time as, as, as I don't doubt their greatness and I don't doubt that there won't be another Bedin at that level. Okay, so but, you can, you but, can... but I also believe that they made the most informed decision based on the information and the facts they had available to them at the time. So you can ask if another. If I present more newer facts, or I present facts that weren't available back then, or the world has changed and therefore the facts are now different. I don't see why it's right, but it has to be a court of the, of the same or, more, or, better, or better staff. Okay, so that we're going to get to also. That's not, not everybody holds it that way. The, the question you're asking, if I could generalize it, that. if I could generalize it is, why doesn't another court, court come and abrogate this? Right? We're, we're certainly not going to abrogate it one-to-one. -one. Like, we're not going to sit down in our own shoes, right? right? But your question is, gen generally, why can't another court come now and abrogate it? Well, to, I, I know why, because they keep going back to this one line. Of no, the, no, 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 that's not so clear. Okay. That's not so clear. And it's, it won't be the punchline of this class. That's not going to be the reason why. Okay? Umiza, anyway, the Baha'i says, Umizei evatel divre bedin shayu bo nevi'in ke askel ben muzi vidan eish kamudot. Nobody can rank on par with those guys. Shehen nimnu v'inhigo et Yisrael v'gola v'shnei amin tovim. Umi kamohem v'hachuma v'inyan. He is assuming, he's assuming that, a, uh, that the bedin that abrogates it has to be greater than the Bedin that originally made it. We're going to see that not everybody assumes that. Okay? That's the Vahai. The next time, this, the question of... And the Vahai's Teshuvah stands. Nobody abrogated the second day of Yom Tov. So at that time, the Karaites have come and gone. They're not a very serious force anymore. Um, I think they number in the thousands these days. So it wasn't a real issue. Um, the next time the issue comes up, is in the 19th century. And it comes up in 19th century Europe. The 19th century Europe is a very interesting place because 19th century Europe is the Enlightenment. Okay? And with the Enlightenment comes, of course, Reform Judaism. And Reform Judaism changes lots of different things. They stop putting on tefillin, they stop doing Shabbat. Um, and the question comes up can we? Not be, be, at the, in the early stages of Reform Judaism, in the 1830s and 40s, in Germany and, uh, and England, the question comes up, do we have to do a second day of Yom Tov? The funny thing, by the way, is that most of the Reform Jews at that time ended up sticking with the second day of Yom Tov. Okay? It obviously didn't make it, but at that time, in the 1830s and 40s, okay, they, um, they mostly uh, stuck with it. I'm not going to talk about Germany and, uh, and England. We're going to move to 19th century Italy. Okay? Italy is not as affected by Reform Judaism, but uh, Italian Jewry is a little bit of an yeah. interesting place in the 19th century. Okay? You have the famous uh, uh, rabbinical seminary of uh, Padua. Right? And in that seminary is established by its Hakshim Oil Regio, by Yashar, and, uh, and uh, the, another famous uh, uh, rabbi in that seminary, of course, is uh, Shadal, right? Uh, Shemuel David Utsato. And um, the question comes to Italian Jewry through the following story. And this happens in 1854 or 1855. A group of uh, businessmen from the town of Mantua, which is in, in, uh, it's in northern Italy, they ask the following question. They say, and they publish this in newspapers across Europe, and they send the question to Hachmei Yerushalayim, 
and it's a big, big question. It's published over uh, on, on two full pages, and they ask, we really want to do away with, with the second day of Yom Tov. We can't work. It's hitting us in our pocketbooks. Nobody really keeps it anyway. We all go to work on Yom Tov, right? Um, and also, by the way, we asked a couple of rabbis around here, and they said really that, Mary Dean, you guys can do away with it. That's what they, that's what they publish in this, uh, in, this, in this major question. Everybody, everybody, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of responses to the questions. It's unclear how many responses we have. We only have the published ones. There were probably, most of the Hachmei Yerushalayim, for example, answered like one-word answers. Like, you guys are idiots. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is, this is a horrific question. We're not even going to grace, grace you with an answer. Okay? The Behind Palachi in Turkey answers the same thing. Three lines, literally. This is, ridi- this is a ridiculous question. You guys are kofi. That, I mean, th- this is kind of the answer from the Israel-Turkey arena. Elsewhere in Europe, lots of different rabbis answer. I'm going to focus on one particular answer. The particular answer that we're going to focus on is Bibi Israel Moshe Hazan's answer. Bibi Israel Moshe Hazan is himself an interesting, uh, an interesting character. He's born in Turkey. When he's three, he moves to Eretz Israel. His father is a big rabbi. He is a child prodigy. He knows a ton. He gets onto the Bedin of Yerushalayim in his 20s. He stays on the Bedin of Yerushalayim for his entire life. He's apparently a brilliant, brilliant Tamir Hakan. Not only is he a brilliant Tamir Hakan, he's extraordinarily charismatic. He's a great arguer. He writes beautifully. He's extremely convincing. And he's kind of, you know, in the middle of the road in terms of where he is. I'm trying not to make political statements, but he's kind of in the middle of the road of where he is politically within Judaism. In this, in this long teshuvah, we're not going to read this, that section, but he makes fun of fanatics. He, he uses the term fanatics on the extraordinarily religious wing, these people who use kemirot, and they know nothing about Judaism. You know, if you ask them if they're Jewish, they show, them, they show you their kamiya instead of showing you their tefillin. He makes fun of those guys. And he also is extraordinarily anti the reform movement and writes multiple books against the reform movement. Okay? Um, he, is, he has a trouble politically in Yerushalayim in his 30s. He ends up being sent by the, uh, the elders in Yerushalayim to go raise money for a new hospital in Yerushalayim all around Europe. He ends up, by the way, not coming back till 20 years later. Over that, court, that, that time period, he visits in London, he visits in Amsterdam, he goes to Rome. In Rome, they have, in, in 1847, the, the Roman Jewish community is in dire straits. They have a terrible relationship with the, uh, with the non-Jewish government over there. Rabbi Israel Moshe Hazan agrees to, to stay there and be the rabbi of the community. He mediates between them. Everything is better than the 1848 revolutions happen, and everything gets worse again. He stays in Rome till 1852, 53. He's about to go back to Israel. He ends up in an island. He, he gets sick on his travels. He ends up in an island off of Greece called Corfu. And uh, in fact, most of the pe- most of the Jews there spoke Italian, which he always also makes fun of, by the way, in this teshuvah. How are these people speaking Italian? They don't know Hebrew? That's the problem with our Jewish education. He literally says that, by the way. So some things don't change. Um, and uh, he stays in Corfu for five years. And he is in Corfu when he gets this question from the uh, businessmen, from the, the, uh, the, the Soharim of Mantua. Okay? And he writes the longest answer. There are five-page answers, famous five-page answers to this question. His answer is uh, 72 pages, okay? And he writes it, and it ends up being published as a book. The book is called Kedushat Yom Tov, okay? So we're going to read parts of it. I don't think we're going to get to everything. We're going to read parts of it. Um, he starts, I want to just get to the technical stuff, and then I want to show you, I want to show you some other stuff that he writes, particularly who he's targeting, and, um, and 
Okay, we'll see. First of all, he quotes Adam Bam, and he says, look at this Adam Bam, source number three. Today, we all go by this calculation, and the logic would dictate that everybody should just do one day. Even the faraway places, that they should do the same thing that the Jews of Eretz Israel do. Everybody is relying on one calculation, both the Jews of Eretz Israel and the Jews of Hutzalai. Aval, and I highlighted this, Takanat Hachamimhu, it is a Takana of Hachamim, Sheyizaharu, Beminhag Avotehem, Sheyvidehem. That everybody uh, be guarding the uh, Minhag that their forefathers um, kept. Now, we said before, I'm oh, sorry, what is your, what's your name? Joey. Joey said before that we can apply the word minhag to this two days of Yom Tov. Haram Bam is not buying it. He's specifically not buying it. He's very clear. And he's changing the words of the Gemara in order to tell you exactly what he thinks. It's not a minhag. It's a takanat hachamim that you follow the minhag. But it's a takana. The Bet Din got together and they made this takana. He's very clear on that. Next halacha, what, are, what, are the, uh, what, what is involved in the takana? From, the, from where, where I underlined over there, Ahad devarim shelamdu atan mefia shemua ve'em Torah shebe'alpeh. He talks about three different types of laws that are, uh, that are part of the laws of lotasur and alpia Torah shel yorucha. And he says... Hadavarim, uh, things that they learned via tradition and things that they learned via midrash halacha, and his last, in the third, the third underlined uh, lines, the hadavarim she'asaum siag la Torah, anything the hachamim made as a uh, uh, fence for the Torah, ufima she'ashat zricha, and whatever that particular time needed, vehena gezerot ve'atakanot ve'aminagot. These, these are the three things, and he calls them three things, so even if you would have called it a minhag, it still would have been under this rubric. Gezerot and takanot and minhagot. These are the three types of things the hachamim can institute, and all of these three, mitzvat aseh lishmor alayin. Veha over al ahad mehen, over velot aseh. There's two mitzvot. There's mitzvat aseh, al piyat Torah asher yorucha, and mitzvat lot aseh, lot asum, and adadar asher yagiru lecha. That's Adam Bam. The, the, uh, I'll call him the Mashiach. That is how he is referred to afterwards. Moshe Israel Hazan. The, the, his initials are Mashiach. Um, he, uh, so so I, I want to go through some of his writing in this. Right? He brings down this Adam Bam. He says clearly Adam Bam calls this a Takana. And I'm going to explain to you the Gemara. And I'm going to show you that the Gemara, by the way, shows that this is a Takana that fits under the exact rubrics that Rambam brings down in Hilchot Mamri. So I'm going to skip the, uh, the 4B section over here that I bracketed. And we're going to go to source number 5, page 6A. Okay, where I underline Hadibur HaRishon, he's explaining the Gemara. Mishum Deshachomita, Gemara says, because they sent from there. The Tzonam Lomar, the Gemara wants to say, Le Olam Amen Alach, De Bizman Hare Ayah, Hare Iyah, whenever they had witnesses, Lo Haita Takana Kuwa Lechor Agola. This was not a Takana for the entire exile. Right away, by the way, he's disagreeing with Rav Hai. Because Rav Hai Gaon said that this was a Takana for the entire exile during all the days of the Second Temple. He didn't have Rav Haim Gaon's Teshuvah, by the way, at all. He's explaining, right, we, we only have it in the 20th century from the Cairo Geniza. He didn't have Rav Haim's Teshuvah. They did two days because of the Safek, not because of any Takana. Only in places where there was a Safek. Now that we know the calculation, right, Levad, we only rely on the calculation. We don't rely on the calculation. We should only do one day. Continue where I underlined. So why do we do two days now? 
It's a new Takana. This is a Takana. He's dating this Takana to when the Babylonian Jews sent their question to Eretz Yisrael, meaning second generation of the Amorayim, approximately. He's dating this Takana to Kolelet Echol And it, 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 this includes the entire exile. There's no differentiation. When, when, where can the messenger reach in one day? No. This is a broad Takana by the Bet Din, that wherever it was in Israel at this time, and they did have one, right? That, uh, that you have to keep two days. And it, the reason is, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the way you know that this is a, is a, a, a takana is because of the words, the shalhum mitam. In another place in the Gemara, there's a, there, in two other places in the Gemara, we have different opinions as to who is shalhum mitam. There's a, there's a the, the widespread opinion is that it's Rabbi Azar ben Pedat, which is a second generation Ebora, that it was his Bet Din. Any time it says in the Gemara, the Shachum I think it says it five or six times, it's the Bet Din of Rabbi Azar ben Pedat. So the, the Takana was made by the Chachmi Israel. According to Mashiach over here, yeah. he's telling you that this is a Takana that was made exactly at that time when they sent the Shachum new Takana. What did they do until then? They followed, they still had the, the Bedin, right? They still had, they still had, either, the either they still had the witnesses in the one, it's, it's, you know what, it's unclear, it's unclear to me whether they still had witnesses. They either followed the witnesses or they just followed the calculation that we know they had. Okay, Hillel II didn't just come up with a calculation out of, you know, out of the blue. They had some sort of calculation. Hadibur Hashani is still explaining to the Gemara, Zaharu I'll, I'll, I'll summarize what he says on this because I, I don't want to go through it exactly. He tells you as follows. What it's been that this is not like we said one kedusha, it's two kedushot. How do I know that? Because min hagavotechem. What's min hagavotechem the same way your forefathers did it? Your forefathers did two days. Why? Because of a safik. So we're instituting another day of Yom Tov, and even though we know that you're going to still do the second day of Yom Tov, you're going to follow all the rules as if it was a suffix. Meaning what? As if it's the only day. What? As if it's the only day. As if you own, only <laughs> one of them is the real day. So if you have a suffix like muktse or nolad or any of those rules where there's a nafkamina, where there's a difference between two kedushot and one kedusha, you still hold two kedushot. Why? Because minhaga v'techem We're instituting a takana, but what kind of takana? It's a, it's a takana, it's a little, we're going to make it a little bit lenient. It's not a full-fledged Yom Tov, you're going to still have some of the rules of Suffolk. Is it the takana that you should do two days Yom Tov, or is it the, is the takana that you should follow and do two days of Yom Tov? So he's explaining, that's a great question, he's explaining that the takana is you got to do two days of Yom Tov, and the words, Hizaru, Gevin Hagavotechem, are the parameters of the Takana. How should you do two days of Yom Tov? The same way your forefathers did it, meaning the same rules that apply to them, Misafek, will apply to you, even though you don't have a Safek. That's how he's reading this. Okay? Hadibur Shlishi, we're on the third page now, 6b. Hadibur Shlishi, Zimnin. He explains this like a she. It's all one line. Continue where I underlined. He has a pool over here that I, that I want to skip. Bechokma atzuma siper shekvar shalchum itam gam hatam letakanatam. Not only did they send you the law, they sent you the reason for the law. Behindu. There, there are times where there may be a decree, and you're going to forget the calculation. Why they send you the reason? Next line of the underlined lines. They gave you a new reason. Remember, what did Rav Hai say the reason was? Rav Hai said the original reason was misafek, and you got to keep, you got to keep it, even though the reason doesn't apply anymore. That's not what Mashiach says over here. He's saying, no, no, no. It's a new gezera, and they gave you a new reason. It's a ta'am hudash. Mukhrah de takana hadasha, he's a cholagulah. It's totally new takana. 
continuing with the underlined lines, they were forced to give a, a, a reason. Remember, Harabam says it's only a takana if you can put it under the parameters of siyag la Torah. He's telling you, ah, this is a siyag la Torah. Because why? You might end up eating hametz. This is protecting you from, God forbid, eating hametz. In case the, there's a decree and you forget the calculation and you're going to end up eating hametz on Pesach. This is a siyag la Torah, so it's a takada. And that, that's a, like the whole thing of siyag la Torah, right? You're, mm-hmm. So now we're, 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 make, we're completely changing the deti. We're not putting on tefillin. We're, we're saying berachot. We're doing all these things mm-hmm. to, to, to avoid the potentiality for the fact that someone's going to mess up the calendar. We're not going to be able to keep it. Mm-hmm. And then we might... But we're doing all these things that we know for a fact shouldn't be done on that day. So he, so he or asked, avoiding things that should be done. So he asks that question later on. I, I didn't bring it in here. And he asks your previous question also later on. You know, and he answers the same answer. And I'll, I'll get to it in a second. But let me just finish reading this. I, and I want to answer both questions. Okay? Um, <laughs> now that it's a siag, now it's considered a takana. piha. Anybody who goes against this takana nidon kizaken mamre is basically a heretic. Okay, that, that, that's what he's trying to say. Um, then he summarizes everything over here in this little box that I put over here. We can skip it. I want to get to, to those two to the two questions. So the first question was, but they're messing every second question. Sorry, was they're messing everything up in order to make a second day of Yom Tov? And the first question, which is I think an even better question, is the reasoning here because. We might mess up because of a potential empire potentially taking over the world and potentially making a, uh, a gezerah and that will force us to forget the calendar, right? So that applies to the Israel also. Mm-hmm. So he asks that question, okay? I don't have it here. I didn't expect the question to be asked and also he addresses it over the course of three pages. So I'll tell you... In summary, what he says, and he answers both of the questions in one. He says like this. First of all, we're not making a break for the people in exile. There's no break. They're continuing to do exactly what they've always done, which is doing two days of Yom Tov. Right? There's no break. Status quo. Now, the reason they're doing the status quo has now changed drastically. Now it's a new takana with a new reason. But if you just came from outer space and observed people in Bavel as to what they do before they went and asked the Babel, the, the, the Bedin in Israel, and right after they asked the Bedin in Israel, you would observe absolutely no change. He says, because of that, he says, and he, and he, and he says, by the way, if you look at the last words here on 7a, the Gemara itself did not have two questions. One of the questions was exactly your question. He, and, and, he, and he addressed it and he says like this, yes, it's very far-fetched that something like that should happen, though he says if you look at the czars of Russia, that kind of happened in their kingdom. And he wasn't alive to see it, but it kind of happened 100 years later uh, uh, with Germany. Okay, it's not so far-fetched. Maybe today it is with communication, so I don't know, nothing's far-fetched, right? We all see enough sci-fi movies that nothing's far-fetched. <laughs> so he's saying, yes, it's very far-fetched, but they weren't changing the status quo in terms of practice. They were giving you a new reason, but they weren't changing the status quo. And that's why they didn't do it for Israel, is because that would have been a change in the status quo. Okay? Um, and uh, and uh, I mean, that's how that's how he that's how he deals with your questions. Yeah. Just the whole point, though, is that if this if we're understanding this as a new takana that's being done by the Amoraim themselves, mm-hmm. then they're saying that takana doesn't apply to Eretz Israel. 
Absolutely does not apply to the but, but then, because they're formulating it themselves. Yeah, but they're they giving decide the shahu mitan means true. it was sent from you. No, that's true, but they're giving you a reason. And the question stands as to meaning the reason would apply to the Jews of Israel also. The reason is because an empire no, might conquer the world. No, because the reason is I'm not concerned about Israel. I'm concerned about the rest of the world. So my yeah, takana but, is only applicable to kingdoms outside of Israel. But the empire might also conquer Israel. But the, the minhag that they're concerned about right. losing right. isn't a minhag that they had in... You no, no, you're right. Meaning the status the same, quo is... Right. That, that, that the takana is how you're going to observe it. You're going to do it according to the, the way you're... That, right. so, that, so that's true. That's true, but the reason of Rashi, meaning Atel Kakulein, Ihamed San Pesach, that would apply to Israel also. That reasoning. So, David, why don't I just answer the simple answer and say, and you decide. And if you decided that Pesach is April 15th, it's April 15th, and Hashem says, fantastic. If we're supposed to be April 12th, no big deal. Hashem says, Hashem Tekreu Otam. You make it Pesach. It's not. It's not <coughs> predestined from Yemo, 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 Yemo. Okay, fine. So, so why don't I just answer that I shouldn't worry about those things? I I shouldn't. What do I need to but, worry but about? But how are you gonna? How you get? How but are you going Right, uh, right. Who's the authority, and how are you gonna know? Right. Yeah. That's what I told yeah. us. I mean, Again, we're well, now in the hypotheticals, but assuming this empire conquered, I'm assuming that they wouldn't allow a Betin to start sending out messages to the rest of the empire to tell them when. So each community is going to now do a separate. Uh, I want you to know that 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 the in in Karai times, I just read this somewhere. I don't I don't remember where. They the the Geonim themselves ended up accepting non-observant communities as long as they kept the calendar in concert with the observ with the observant communities. Meaning the calendar is like the unifying force of the Jews. So like to say, yeah, okay, each community is gonna call it on their own thing. I mean, you end up started with you end up you end up killing uh, you know national unity. Didn't that whole the whole concept start with the Omer and Shavuot and the whole conversation? I don't know how it's I don't know how it started, but it's definitely one of the uh, one of the primary uh, um, uh, uh, controversies. So, but what, what's but what's the issue in terms of how does that answer the other question, which is we're not putting up Kibbe in which. Uh, it was a room Meaning, in yeah, so it's a, we, we, we're not we changing the status quo. Yeah. Right. You weren't doing it before. No, you, you weren't, weren't doing it before change. anyway. But why? You didn't have that problem. But why? Why is that okay, is my question. Are you just changing <laughs> the no, reason? But, but the fact, but the reason now applies to Israel. No. So why does it matter whether you had them in hide before or not? It, because, because like, like in any other legal system, the, the, the precedential practice matters. Whatever happened before, whatever people were doing before, matters. That's why, and it's tr- and it's true again. It's true in any precedent. Yeah, but the matters. fact in, in, ju- in any in any judicial system, at least in the United States, the fact pattern matters. In other words, right. if you have a if you have a decision, and the right. decision is based on facts, so, you can argue that that decision doesn't apply to facts. So, so this is, uh, this is so this is the constant why. stress, and this is uh, this is going to end up being a punch on here. But this is the constant stress in any legal system is between reason and tradition and practice and precedent. This is like a constant give and take in any legal system. I, I mean, can ne- I, it, I don't want to say never, but it's hard to say without giving you an example, right? It's hard to say. X always wins because n- there's never one that always right. wins. I give you an example: a landmark building. Right, you can build new construction that's healthier and whatever, but at the same time, you want to preserve mm-hmm. some historical uh, monument, whatever thing. So, have that struggle between. How do you, then you have. I mean, you have it all. You have it all the time. So, I, I nothing. There's nothing that always wins. Um, I want to get to to two other things. 26a b over here. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. If, if you can, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it happens to be a wonderful little thing where he takes back his humrot, okay, and he says the following. I'm going to summarize, and he says the following. He says, if it were up to me, I'll tell you what I would do. If it were up to me, 
I would get all the rabbis, all the important rabbis, he's leaving out a certain segment, which I'll get to in a second. That's the he next says one. the reason is, he, Mashiach himself addresses the question, and he says the reason is because of this safek issue. Okay? And you have the safek issue, and, 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 and by the way, it's very clear, and he's clear about this, everybody except for the Hatam Sofer is clear about this the second day of Yom Tov in the Dirabanan. Everybody is clear. It's a takanat hachami. Yeah, what's the takanat hachami? I'm worried about Hatam Sofer writes. It's as if it's a Noraita. It's not a Noraita. It's very, right uh, it's very I, clear. It's not a Noraita. I, I understand. My point is everybody agrees it's a it's a, uh, it's a Dirabanan. Just, just so you understand, meaning there are kulot that come with it being a Dirabanan. Okay? Now, I want, I, I, just, I want to read this section, number five, because this is, this is really good, and he introduces a new concept. I know there's not a lot of time left here. Mehastechem rabotai. He's asking the people of Mantua, Don't listen to some of these people who think that they're hachamim. He's very clearly referring to uh, uh, Rigi over here, and there's another place in here where he goes on a two-page... Uh, 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 rant against uh, Regio, and he says, "Don't listen to those people." They can they can carry like the the implements that you use for uh, for your donkey. That that's what their chokhmah is useful for. Don't don't be seduced by their uh, by their words. I will never tell you anything wrong. I he, he, he makes a lot of swears in this book. He writes Elokim exclamation point a lot of times. If I would have just known, if you gave me one small reason to be matir for you, I would be matir. Uh, skip two lines. And I would not be afraid of anybody. I express my opinions. I don't care what anybody thinks. If I had a reason to be matid, I would be matid. I would not even care for my own life. About Tedru, next line, I can't find a reason to be matid. He's being very... Uh, conciliatory towards them. He, he wants to convince them that they shouldn't do this. And, uh, and I know that you're going to respect the rabbis. Now, I will There will not be one book that you can find that will tell you it's okay to be mehalel, the second day of Yom Tov, or sheyore mitocho eze petach katan, or that will even show you one small uh, a loophole for you to get through. Lo nimtza b'shum ofen sheba'olam, ela shemitoch divrehem lamadnu, sherim sherech isuro hukal midrabanan, this is a drabanan law, keneged ze, compare violating the second day of Yom Tov to the following, you have two options. You can either just go to work on Yom Tov, or you can decide that Yom Tov Shani doesn't apply anymore. Which is worse? What's the difference? What? Go to work on Yom Tov. You can just go to work. One is reformed. I'm a, I'm a, you know what? I'm a, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. But I gotta go to work. That's what you're saying. Okay? Or. You can say, no, it doesn't apply anymore. It says, if he built his own Mizbeach, and he's going after his own heart. Which is better? The latter, you're saying. Well, the latter is worse. He's going to tell you in a second. Listen to what he says. My faithful crowd. Why would you run away from the obstacle of just sinning and run towards the tiplu el hapahat? Right, he's quoting from Echa, pahat uh, vefahat, and and you will fall into the obstacle hagadol, which is a bigger one, shehu aminut, which is heresy. So he's telling you, just be a sinner. Just be a sinner. Don't be a heretic. Don't justify it. 
right? Don't justify it. Exactly. Don't, stay, ju- stay the data. don't justify yeah. it, right? So this is this is fascinating because this is like a classic thing that we see all the time. Can is it better to be a sinner or a heretic? He he clearly comes out in the well, side. I mean, of, the, the, it's better to be a sinner. Better to be an orthodox sinner than to be a reformed. Yeah. Right. So I, I saw Hillel Halkin once write something like, "I like to det- I like to be able to determine the rules of the synagogues that I don't go to." Okay, so something something along. No, but I think that's a fair well, that's a fair logic. It's like listen, I I'm not going to say that the rabbis were wrong in telling me this rule. I can't keep it because it's not for me, whatever it is. But you know, but, it, but it's still a people, rule, and I agree as opposed to rule. those people who say I don't talk that that's not a rule for me. Right. So okay, Which fine. We all talk. I think we all. Some, so so this so this is so 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 this is his teshuvah. That's his conclusion. He goes through the technical stuff. He goes through the oratory. It's beautifully written. It's. It's long, and it's the most famous response to this. Uh, uh, Rabbi Faul talks about this extensively in his biography of, of Mashiach. He wrote the, the biography, the uh, authoritative biography on the Bisa, uh, uh, Moshe Yisrael Hazan. Um, I wanted to go through this Teshuvah. I'll go through it. This is the Teshuvah of Torah Chesed. He is uh, uh, Rav Shneur Zaman uh, uh, Frakdin. He lives at the same time as um, all the Italian rabbis were talking about, but in Eastern Europe. And he has this question, he says, I have, we have this concept, anything that, that is a takana, you need another bedin to come and be matir la takana. He goes through the disagreement between Harambam, Harambam and the Ra'avad. Harambam says you need a bedin that is greater than the previous Bedin, that Avad says if the reason doesn't apply anymore, you don't need it. For greater Wait, what does that mean, greater? Any Bedin. I, I, don't, I don't understand the concept of greater. How does he define greater? So, I, I would. What does that mean? Can't be a lower court. I can say that. Yeah, but, but how do you, he, he has a good question, which is how do you define the level. No, but is it greater quality wise or the same level? In other words, is it a Bedin of 23? It's talking about Chokhmah um, and Both the number of people and Chokhmah. How do you define it? Right, so Chokhmah is the question. Right, so I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm telling you, I don't have an answer. I don't think it's a Russian machine. Right, okay. That's what I mean. No, unless everybody recognizes it. So the Ravad says it's just as improbable. Well, no, but, but but in other words, but what type of court can overturn it? One that everyone recognizes. Yeah. It would be great. Yeah. No, of course, it's yeah. impossible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. One so, that everyone recognizes. So so the Ravad says the Ravad says that's not the case. You don't need a greater bedin. If the reason doesn't apply anymore, any group of people, any any bedin worth its salt can get together and repeal the previous bedin. As long as the reason doesn't apply anymore. His problem is as follows. He goes through this like encyclopedic... But this reason does apply. What? This reason does apply. This reason doesn't apply. I mean, it does. But now, it does. Now, now the way you did it. Remember what the reason was. The reason was that after the Kukule, the empire might come. And, right, I mean, so, that why, so that's that always going to apply today. That doesn't really apply today. I, I, I would argue that that doesn't apply today. Okay? That doesn't apply. I would argue that doesn't apply today. doesn't apply that the empire oh, conquers yeah, everybody. Why? I, I, ISIS, you think, you think people no, living under ISIS rule yeah. can use their cell phones freely and text that uh, email and track of your on Facebook? No. In such a situation. Would you lose track of your calendar in such a situation? I, I would argue... I don't know. I, you know you what? In a refugee camp? You, you have, 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 have millions, millions of Jews losing right. that bit of information... Right, when, so some people when, yeah, this when we, are, we are the most educated group of Jews in history. We're the most educated group of people in history. It's not It's, 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 it's not difficult like to say that the reason. So what would we need to need to do? I want to just take this tissue back. He says the following. He says, he's got he says, I got a problem with this whole Koda Vashiba Minyan thing. He goes through this kind of like uh, this, this laundry list of this Torah this, uh, this, this, uh, this Chesed and he says he says uh, he says I have this laundry list of Takanot that we actually abrogated and we don't follow them. he says uh, and he says I'll list them to you he says that we were not, instituted by whom? what? By that way, they were instituted by our Chavim and he had, I'll give you an example Gvinot Akum cheese made by, by a non-Jew Inyan Yom Edam, doing business on a week that is their uh, Christmas week, right? Uh, women going out with jewelry on Shabbat. 
lending to a goy with interest. You, you were originally not allowed to do it. He's like, I got this whole list of things that, that were takanot, and, and yet we, we, we just don't follow them anymore. What is it? And he, and he tries to come up with... They were minhagim. But is he using that as all the more reason why this is... No, so, so, so he says he's really bothered by this, and he comes up with three rules. He's like, I got three rules for you. Don't break up centrality. He's like, the, I got three rules for you. The, the three rules are as follows. If the original takana didn't apply to everyone, then the takana could be abrogated. Okay? By the way, this didn't apply to everyone. It didn't apply to Israel. Okay? Okay? Uh, he says, I'll give you another one. He says... No, but I think he would no. consider that. No, he's talking about everyone, everyone outside of Eretz Yisrael. I'll tell you what. He, ex- he uses, in some takanos that he discusses here, he excludes very minor groups of people and says, oh, this is a reason you can abrogate it. I have a question. Does the fact that Abhai Gaon brought this up, that these were Nebi'im, Yaskel ben Buzi and and Daniel, does that give it an extra weight that we should be doing so, this up, over and above a regular quote unquote baby the, the problem of heavy, heavy hitters. So I don't think so. Yeah. Certainly in Rambam's philosophy, the Nebi'im's legislature le- legislative status is n- is no different just because they're prophets. Meaning yeah. there's a system and they were part of the system. So I, I, I don't think so. The other thing is that Rav Haiz Teshuvah is difficult because it goes against the Pshat of the Gemara, which is that during the, the Second Temple period, there were plenty of places doing one day. And he says that that wasn't the case. Now, I, I don't know if, if there, the, the answer is to say that Rav Haiz Teshuvah is itself just a further expansion of what he was calling Rav Sa'ad Yaz Teshuvah, which is just a way, a polemic against the Karaites. Or, or whether he's doing something which I don't necessarily understand from a legal standpoint. I, I don't know. Okay? But it's a difficult teshuvah. No, no question about it. And going back to this, so he, he gives you one, that's one thing, that's one, one, one loophole of a, taka, a takana that could be abrogated as if, it was, if it didn't apply to everybody originally. Another one is if everyone knows the reason and the reason doesn't apply anymore, meaning if everyone knows the reason, it's an obvious one, Everybody knows the reason, and the reason doesn't apply anymore. Then you can also abrogate it. And the third one he says is if the takana now causes more harm than good, which is itself very arbitrary. Who's going to decide that? If it causes more harm than good, then you can also abrogate it. Those are his parameters. It's all three or one of them. <laughs> Any of the three. Okay. Now I, I would argue that certainly second day of Tov could be categorized under at least one, mm-hmm. maybe all three. Um, <laughs> so I, I so I want I want to so I'm going to suggest the following as to as to why uh, why we do uh, why we still do the second day of Yom Tov, um, and it's based on the two articles that the Shirut is based on. The first is by Meir uh, Ben uh, who was Rabbeinu Yitzchak Nisim's son. He was a religious academic who tried to merge the the uh, worlds of academia and his brand, I guess, of being religious. Um, and he wrote a book about the second day of Yom Tov, and he goes through this entire thing, and he says, look, we've been keeping this for 2,000 years. That's why you can't abrogate this now. There's a precedent of 2,000 years of keeping this. And the way law works is if you have precedent of 2,000 years, it's really, really difficult to abrogate it, okay? If you, uh, 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 you can see this concept, by the way, outside of, of either, either law or, or Judaism totally. There's a, uh, again, I call him a financial philosopher. Uh, he wrote the book, The Black Swan. Uh, you, people, you people might have heard this. He says, he, says, he says the following. He says, very interesting idea. A, a human being or a living thing the lifespan is, is negatively correlated with how long it's already lived. A person who lives a long time, chances are the rest of his life is going to be short because he's already lived a long time. He says, same thing with any animal, any living thing, right? The longer that thing has lived, the shorter he has yet to live. He says ideas are precisely the opposite. The longer they've lived, the longer their potential lifespan is in the future. This is an idea of philosophy, okay? I think what Benayahu is doing in this is saying something along the same lines. We've had this for 2,000 years. 
the, the weight of evidence that you'd need to, to, to uh, 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 abrogate it is tremendous. Jacob Katz, who's another Jewish academic who wrote an article after Benayah, who uses a lot of Benayah sources, and he also wrote an article on, uh, on the second day of Yom Tov, he argues something which goes a little bit further. He says, this is not how law works. He says, if you go back to the Torah Chesed Teshuvah and you look at all the laws that were abrogated, I'll give you a very simple reason why they were abrogated. They were abrogated by Hachamim after the fact. Meaning, the spread of people not following it has already happened. Law works as follows. We're not going to pick up and say, simply from our reason, from our logic, we're going to take a gezerah and we're going to say, this look at it, that doesn't apply anymore. That, that never happens in law. It, that's not never, it rarely happens in law. Combine that with Benayahu's, th- Benayahu's point of this has been, been uh, 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 a, a, a practice for 2,000 years. Very difficult. It, that's not how law works. Laws that are on the books don't get taken off the books just because the reason doesn't apply anymore. Well, that speaks to the Minister Moshe Hazan's point about being a sinner and being an Apicotis. What do you mean? All these people who are so they, they just... They, they they're, yeah, they're, they're using reason. They say, we, we, we can just we can use our reason and now change things up. So they just... So, so, so Kat says, no, the only time you're going to end up changing things up, halakha <coughs> is very frequently dictated by, by minha, the minhag of Israel. Okay? And we're not going to take something that's been high Israel and just due to reason alone rip it off the books. Okay, so that was the tipping. What? Well, yeah. So that's, so that's a different concept, which is it's a gezera she'ena tzibure cholim la'amod I think it's logical, but it's troublesome. Yeah, not, not because not, if the reform movement continues to grow, then what do we say? Well, I, I, I'm not going to get into the, the, the Christianity is over, you know, I'm, two billion. I'm not billion. right. I'm not going to get into <laughs> into the politics of reform or their no, no, but my their own is, demographics, which are disastrous, by the way. But that's not that's not that's not. I, I don't not comparing to reform. I'm just saying the idea of when people enough people break down and start driving to shul on Shabbat because it's too expensive to live next to the shul. Right. When enough people do that and they're driving from miles and miles away, so, you know, then maybe, okay. So I'd, I'd okay argue that, there, that there's a complex Electric. set of factors here. There's no, a complex, I'm stretching it here. I'd say I, that there's I'm a just, complex set of factors here that probably includes the severity of the sin, that includes the actual... Mm-hmm. Uh, the actual minhag that's going on, right? If you look at the severity of some of the things that were done, that the Torah Chesed brings down, they're certainly not, they don't get to the level of driving on Shabbat. I, I mean, it's just, right? There's, there's a complex interplay of factors here. I think Benayahu's point is one of those factors, how long something has been done. The other thing Benayahu brings down is that this is done in public. Some things you do in private. You eat cheese of, an aku, of, a, of, of a non-Jew, you eat it in your own house, Right? Or, uh, or a woman goes out with jewelry, it's a small thing. When everybody shows up to shul on the second day of Yom Tov, and now we're going to abrogate it, another, it's, another set, it's another factor. I'm not saying there's one or two factors. I'm saying there's a complex sense. set of factors. Yeah. I just want to say, is that based on the scope of the, knowledge, of the information that you've reviewed on this topic, if I'm not mistaken, that when there's, there's a concept that I've Familiar with throughout Judaism of Ma'alim Bekedusha Ben Yordin or Ben Maridin or whatever. But this has nothing to do with Kedusha. You've, uh, you've sanctified right. a day. You've said this is a holiday, and like you said, for 2,000 years, but for everybody's reason? doing it. But, but for what reason? I'm saying, why can't it be but as basic as that? The, but say, there's the concept of not overbearing the people. The with all the, I mean, with all the respect, this is the same. Uh, on a theoretical level, you say it in the this is the same yeah. thing as saying we've had slaves for two thousand years. So why are we gonna get rid of slavery now? You, so you, well, they're not equal. So you know what? By the way, I, you want to know what? now that we know they I, work. I want to continue your point, and I want to say, you know what? You're right. And when did it change? When did it change? It, oh, you're right. But here's but, my question. Here's right thing, now, right? if, if here's well, the all thing. I'm going to say was... In, was, in the 1793, get... Thomas Jefferson writes, he's like, the slavery thing... Uh, was it, was it, I think it was Jefferson, or in 1803, he writes, he's like, I see this slavery thing. It's coming. It's going to destroy our union. We should just get rid of it now. I see it. He says, it's like a nightmare that I have in the middle of the night. But they didn't. The reason dictated that they should have. Things don't change till they do. But my question, my question, my, je- my, my final question is, 
if we were able to, let's say we had chief rabbis of every community, every large sect of Orthodox Judaism, right? And they decided, we're getting rid of this. So I don't think they, they would. I, I don't think Is they there would. anything that would, other than the fact that well, that will never happen? I don't think they would <laughs> in the context <laughs> of this. <laughs> meaning, even if they could theoretically, yeah, by why, reason why alone, they? they wouldn't because reason alone doesn't dictate al I'm sorry. Did I not? Was that not a question? That, <laughs> Which one, the Maldi and the yeah, Brothers? What's the? I so I, in, I I'll tell you what I I came across at least uh, dozens of teshuvot, and I've not seen that concept mentioned once. Is, is it the idea of a shul? You can't then use it for something after that, or a bit. So you're, doing, that, you're dealing with a physical object. Kodesh, no. Kodesh comes Ma'alim with three flavors: no, 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 time, no, no, place, no, and no, uh, no, but that, but the extent, uh, identity. Except the statement of Ma'alim Kodesh is based upon, right? The it's a physical says, object. It's based upon Korah's group of people, right? They took the Mahdot, and then they made him like Wafahim and Kula Mizbeah. And the Gemara says, that's how we learn Ma'alim Bakodesh. A physical object that's been used for one thing can be used to, for a higher Kiddushah level. Not but, a day. But Not you can't smart. reduce the Kiddushah level of an object. It's speaking only about objects. So, so you'd like to expand it to time. Smart, I right? think it makes sense. <laughs> to apply it as one. Right, but, but, but there were thousands You can't make up a holiday. Of, I'm just curious to know if anybody... It's not a holiday. So you can't make it up. And again, there are dozens of teshuvot on this. And I, I, again, it wasn't brought down by Benaya or Katz. Uh, I didn't read all the teshuvot because there are thousands of pages on this. So I, I can't tell you for sure that it hasn't been brought up. Just that I haven't seen it. a couple of hours. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Mashiach teshuvah took a, a couple of hours. Um, but I think, I think that's the, the punchline is law doesn't change based on reason alone. It changes based on a complex set of social factors. Oh, but, but they can and, overturn a takana? Of course they can. But yeah. you, need, you need you need this, this what set asking. of social what is, factors. What is the... I, my point is you can't, you can't just boil it down to a list. That's not how law works. It's not how it works. It's not how it works in America. It's not how it works in, in any other legal system. And it's not how it works in the, for, for the Torah. I'm not comparing the two, but there are certain basic skeletal elements that all legal systems have. And this is something I think that you find in all legal systems. Law doesn't work that way. It doesn't work by reason alone. We don't change law just because of reason. We change law because of reason and societal change moving together. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you all for coming and making this class a success. We have any other questions. Thank you, Baruch. 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 Thank you, Ba